Hello, good morning everybody. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mary, for uh, having me here. Thank you very much to INCF uh, to give me this opportunity and to, I really look forward actually to those days to, to discuss how we can interface experiments and modeling and, and data analysis. And I guess the, the subject on which uh, I've been working for the, the last uh, 15 years or so is particularly amenable to, uh, to this type of, uh, of interaction and what you just uh, actually described. So uh, what we're going to go through is uh, a series of, uh, of data sets that we obtained in rather recently in the last few years. And uh, our attempts at actually modeling this uh, data set uh, to understand uh, what's the interplay between uh, receptor organization at excitatory synapses and the uh, synapse function. And uh, really, I have actually, although I'm, I'm really not uh, a very serious modeler, I'm just doing that slightly on the side, but certainly over the older years, I, I've came to, to realize that really uh, modeling our, our data has been extremely helpful in actually understanding what, what, what they mean. And that's kind of the message I'm going to try to, to convey to you. Uh, so bridging uh, super resolution imaging, uh, single molecule tracking of MPA receptor, dynamic organization, and uh, synaptic function. Uh, so, our uh, object of interest are uh, excitatory glutamatergic synapses. I'm sure you all know uh, that those mostly occur on the small protrusions that are called spines. They are pretty small, and that's the main reason for using super-resolution imaging methods to look at their organization. Uh, those synapses are really uh, at the base of uh, brain function. And of course, understanding how they work is extremely important to understand human behavior, memory, learning, and uh, also many uh, neurogenerative diseases and, uh, and brain pathologies. And uh, we are going to concentrate on the postsynaptic side of these uh, synapses, trying to understand uh, what's the organization of these receptors and uh, how the organization of these receptors and this dynamic organization actually uh, has an impact on, on synapse function. So these glutamatergic synapses, uh, they harbor a whole variety of molecules and in particular a whole variety of receptors. We're going to concentrate just on one subtype of receptor, which are called the AMPA receptors, which are cationic ion channels uh, opened by binding of glutamate. And those are really the receptors that mediate all uh, excitatory uh, basal uh, synaptic transmission. Uh, that's kind of another schematic view of that uh, postsynaptic uh, synapse, a whole variety of molecules, actually thousands of, of molecules, and uh, most of them are known, I would say, by now, uh, at least from their, their molecular uh, sequence. Uh, what really we don't know is how they're actually organized together, although from biochemical data we have a lot of information on how they actually all interact with one the other, actually how they are actually really organized uh, at the nanoscale is really something that's just beginning uh, to be understood. And the, one of the messages I really want to, to convey to you today is that actually uh, knowing the molecules is just not enough. We really have to understand how uh, they are localized and how they are dynamically interacting over, over time. And for example, one of the reasons for that is that if you look at the way uh, glutamate is released from the presynaptic side, uh, what we are going to see is that actually uh, when a vesicle is released in the, and releases its content in the synaptic cleft, actually there's only a subset of the area of the postsynaptic membrane that's really uh, sensitive to that glutamate because there's the number of molecules uh, of glutamate release is actually pretty low. And so knowing whether receptors are here or here or here actually does make a, a difference. And uh, one of the hallmarks, actually, of this, the organization of these uh, of this synapses, which is uh, also important, is that although there's lots of uh, different molecules, uh, their actual numbers is pretty low. And uh, sometimes it's, it can be as low as just a few of them. For example, if you look at the NMDA receptors that we won't talk about today, uh, some synapses only have one or two of these uh, receptors, and in most cases, it's 
it's only around 10 receptors. Uh, so getting numbers and how they organize this is uh, really important. So that's of what's called the, the scaffold of these, uh, of these synapse. Uh, the other aspect that's very important is that this overall organization is extremely dynamic. And we actually know that synapses are dynamic since a very long time. Uh, over uh, 40 years ago, uh, in fact, it was found by, by in this seminal work from uh, Bliss and Lomo uh, that actually the efficacy of synaptic transmission is extremely plastic. And you I'm sure you all know these uh, seminal experiments, uh, whereby recording uh, uh, synapse efficacy in the, in the hippocampus, the, those authors found that when you do high-frequency stimulation of the afferent pathway, uh, you can change very rapidly and for a very long time the efficacy of synaptic transmission, either potentiating it or depressing it, depending on the way you make the, the stimulation. And very early on, those authors proposed that this could be uh, the cellular base of memory. And after lots of uh, bloodshed and wars in the field, uh, it was actually, uh, we are coming to an age, I, I would say, that's rather accepted now that indeed uh, plasticity of synaptic transmission is one of the core mechanisms of, uh, of learning and, uh, and memory. And so reconciling this uh, complex organization of the, of the old synapse and the plasticity of this function is really a very challenging question that, uh, that needs uh, concerted effort for many, many fields, uh, including uh, neuro neuroinformatics. So, uh, in terms of this plasticity, uh, a, a turning point uh, occurred about 10 years ago, I would say, from when a, a number of labs uh, actually found out that one of the basic principles, one of the basic mechanisms of these changes in the synaptic efficacy uh, occurred through change in the number of receptors in the postsynaptic membrane. It's not the only mechanism, but it's, it, it really, it's coming apparent that it's one of the major mechanisms of uh, plasticity of these excitatory synapses, at least uh, in the hippocampus. Uh, and so the idea is that if you increase the number of receptors in front of the release site, you potentiate synaptic transmission. If you decrease the number of receptors, uh, you um, decrease synaptic transmission. And so really it became a pretty important conundrum to understand how you could at the same time have this very complex organization of the receptors and at the same time being able to regulate very rapidly uh, their numbers and maintain that over time. And that's one of the really the major question we've been uh, we've been asking over the over the years. Uh, so getting into this organization of the receptors and how it can be dynamically uh, organized, uh, one has to realize that our view of the organization of these, re these receptors has been changing uh, dramatically over the years. Uh, the, if you look at the very first images of uh, those AMPA receptor localization by EM. Uh, back uh, in the, in the, the mid-90s, uh, at that time, using uh, post-amining immuno, immunogold, only a few gold particles were found in synapses, and, and those type of data actually set uh, something that was very wrong, uh, a dogma that there was only a few AMPA receptors per uh, synapse, and they were all concentrated in the postsynaptic membrane. And as uh, new data become available, that view actually changed uh, quite extensively. Uh, up to uh, the current view, uh, which was initially uh, developed, I guess, from uh, freeze fracture replicas, uh, finding over hundreds of uh, receptors in the synapse, but also lots of receptors in the extrasynaptic membrane. And as we'll see, there are actually much more extrasynaptic receptors than synaptic receptors. And then recently, uh, development of super-resolution optical methods actually allowed to use optics uh, to visualize receptor organization from the, this first work from the lab of Jia Zhang using STORM to look at uh, organization of receptors. And then uh, only last year, actually, three papers came out uh, nearly simultaneously, one from our group I'll describe, and then two others. 
uh, using a variety of super resolution methods together with electron microscopy, uh, finding that actually AMPA receptors are not diffusely distributed in the postsynaptic membrane, but seem to be organized in very small uh, nanoclusters. And I'll start by describing those clusters of receptors and then go on to discuss what could be their function and how uh, then we'll go into how is the dy receptors dynamically organized uh, into that. So, uh, in terms of dynamics, uh, that's first slide introducing that. Uh, beyond the localization and organization of receptors in the postsynaptic density, as I told you, we now know there's a lot of receptors also in the extrasynaptic membrane. And uh, something I, I think quite important we found uh, more than 10 years ago now, is that receptors can actually exchange all, all the time between synaptic locations and extrasynaptic location through surface diffusion. And we found that uh, by doing single molecule tracking, uh, tagging little fluorophores to the receptors and doing video microscopy, finding that receptors can diffuse uh, constantly between those different sites at pretty high rates. And I'll show you our recent developments of that. Uh, receptors also actually traffic between the surface and the intracellular uh, compartments of the, of the neuron by uh, recycling events. Those are extremely important also. They occur on a slightly uh, slower time scale, while those diffusion events uh, occur in the millisecond to second time scale. Uh, those recycling events occur more in the tens of seconds to minutes time scale. And just for a matter of choice, I won't talk at all about these, these events uh, today, but we can discuss them uh, uh, later on. What we are going to get into is really understanding uh, how are those receptors organized, as I said, in the PSD, how they do exchange between the PSD and the extrasynaptic membrane, and how this fast exchange by surface diffusion actually impact uh, fast synaptic transmission. So some of the open questions, and I, I won't have time to go through all of them, but just to I, in echo to, to, to what you were saying in your introduction, some of the things that I think are important to look at from a neuroinformatic perspective are the one, the first question that we are going to tackle, it is what's the dynamic of this nanoscale organization of receptors? How does it impact synapse function? What's the function of this fast amper receptor diffusion? What's the balance between synaptic and extrasynaptic receptors? What's the dynamic interplay between surface diffusion and recycling? What are the sites of AMPA receptor insertion of removal? How does regulation of this traffic contribute to synapse plasticity? And really, it's, it's really my deep uh, feeling that understanding all these different questions really, really requires not only new experiments, but also uh, modeling data to actually be able to put all this in an uh, in understandable uh, framework. So I have divided my talk in mostly three parts. First, we're going to look at static uh, data, uh, looking at how receptors are organized at the nanoscale, uh, and then uh, show you what are the evidence we have that AMPA receptors are mobile not only between synaptic and extrasynaptic sites, but also uh, actually inside the PSD, and then and, and to uh, look what could be this, the function of this uh, quick amper receptor mobility in fast synaptic uh, transmission. Uh, so first, uh, show you our recently published data that amper receptor are organized in nanoclusters. Uh, for that, uh, we've been using uh, both uh, electron microscopy, but mostly uh, single molecule based super resolution methods. So I'm not going to talk extensively about those methods at all, just to give you, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the, the hallmark of, of what I think is a very important uh, development in the field of imaging that occurred a, a few years ago in terms of obtaining nanoscale resolution uh, images uh, with optics of, uh, of molecular organization. And so the basic principle is to use a dye. Uh, it could be a genetically encoded protein or an organic dye. You can, you can photo switch what, whatever the method is not so important. And you photo switch uh, that dye uh, between uh, one color and another color or between a dark state and an open st and a light state. And you're going to image the dyes one by one in order to go from a very blurry image to a very high resolution image. 
And the idea is that you're going to image those dyes one by one, <coughs> or a few at a time, so that you can resolve each of these of the single organic dyes of each of the single dyes. Sorry, and you can actually localize each of these single dyes with a very high precision, which can go down to a few nanometer, uh, because you perfectly know what's the point threat function of these uh, dyes and the the fluorescent. Uh, aspect of the spot, and then you do that over and over again until you can actually reconstruct a super-resolved image uh, that has gained uh, more than an order of magnitude in terms of, of resolution. A variation of this method uh, that you can use, that I, I'll show you lots of data with, is called uh, dynamic palm or single particle tracking palm, where at the same time as you look at the localization of the molecules, you also look at their movement, so you get, you get at the same time both uh, the super resolved image, but also uh, the dynamics of all the different <coughs> uh, molecules. So some data here obtained on these receptors tagged with one of these photoswitchable proteins that's called DIOS, that's normally in a green form and then can be switched to a, a red form. And uh, you acquire stacks of images uh, with literally hundreds of thousands of data points uh, given all the location of all the different single molecules. They all are activated and then they photo bleach one by one. Uh, getting a single image takes several minutes, but you can actually accelerate that now with new cameras and uh, bet better dyes and go down to a few seconds to, act to obtain a whole stack of, uh, of images. I won't talk at all about it uh, here, but just to let you know that, of course, gathering all this data and analyzing all this single molecule data very efficiently actually requires a lot of informatics, not neuroinformatics specifically, but a lot of informatics. And uh, there's there's not a week in nature methods where there's not a new algorithms and new methods to actually uh, analyze all these single molecule tracks. But I, I won't go into that at all uh, today. So anyway, from this single molecule data, you can actually reconstruct a super resolved image. And there we found uh, really our first uh, big surprise uh, in this project is that going from a uh, uh, an, an image of a spine where you have the, those uh, AMPA receptors which look very diffuse. Uh, when you look with this uh, enhanced resolution, you see these uh, nanoclusters of receptors that seemed very concentrated uh, with the in, the, in that spine. Uh, this is a, another image. Uh, you're looking now at endogenous receptors with a variation of this single molecule method, which is called STORM. Uh, this is the classical diffraction limited wide field image of AMPA receptors uh, distribution. This is the super resolved STORM image. You see it's extremely spotty. And if you look at individual spines here uh, in the boxes, you see that in, in all cases, the receptors are very concentrated in those small clusters. These are uh, 3D renderings uh, of, these, um, of these images. Th those cultures here, those hippocampal cultures we are using, are very flat. So 3D is, is not so impressive, but you can see in any case that these are really uh, individual clusters. So what are the properties of these clusters? Uh, they are very homogeneous in their size. Uh, with, this is the distribution of their size obtained from Gaussian fit with a size in the order of 80, 90 uh, nanometer uh, diameter. What's extremely valuable is the actual number of nanodomains per spine. And actually, so looking at those properties with uh, various uh, super resolution methods, including this, the this other uh, STED method, uh, you see that the, the number of nanodomains per spine is very viable. On average, it's around one and two nanodomains per spine, but uh, it can be none or uh, up to five, six nanodomains per spine. And I'm not showing you the data here, but what, what we found is the actual number of nanodomains per spine is extremely proportional to the actual overall size of the, of the spine. Uh, when we, we tried to, to submit that, uh, that data, uh, we actually had some resistance from a, a variety of reviewers. And because this was, this was very uh, different from what had been seen previously uh, by electron microscopy data, and so it was thought that these 
this type of organization we are seeing might be an artifact from the technique, the optical technique we were using, and so we are pressed pretty hard to to, to uh, use EM to look at this type of data. And as I showed you previously, in fact, most of the previous EM data hadn't seen this type of organization of the receptors, which, were, which was a bit surprising. But we actually found uh, the solution for, for this. Uh, and it was just a, met a matter of the labeling method that, that had been used. And so we went on and uh, used uh, pre-embedding in actually live cell labeling of surface AMPA receptors using a new antibody very efficient for the extracellular domain of these uh, AMPA receptors for the GRAY2 subunit. And there uh, we found uh, immediately that indeed uh, those receptors at the EM level were localized in these, uh, in these clusters. Here, it's not all synapses. You see, some synapses uh, exhibit some uh, exhibit diffuse labeling, but in fact, most of the, of the spines uh, do exhibit this type of uh, of organization. And if you look at the size of these clusters, uh, they are mo about the, the same size we found with uh, uh, superposition optical microscopy. Uh, some more data on these uh, clusters. Something we are, we've been pretty interesting, interested by is actually understanding uh, and determining what's the number of receptors that are present in each of these clusters. And so that's one attempt we've made at understanding that. Uh, so this is a cluster here. And in those images, these storm images, uh, you see also these individual spots here. And uh, we thought that this could actually represent individual receptors. Uh, so what we did is uh, take those uh, smaller spots, look at their distribution of fluorescent intensity. We found that they were actually perfectly fit by two Gaussians. And this could be uh, coming from either from the fact that uh, there are actually in these receptors two subunits of uh, this GLUA2 we are labeling, or the fact that the, the antibody we are using uh, have two fluorophores. We, ha we haven't quite uh, deciphered the reason why. Uh, anyway, uh, what was important is that actually all these single spots here uh, we thought could correspond to individual entities, and we just then took the overall intensity of individual uh, nanoclusters and divided them by the median intensity of these single, uh, single spots. And we found, on average, uh, that each of these uh, nanoclusters uh, had about something like 25 uh, of these individual nanoobjects. And so it, they, they was suggesting that each of these clusters had, on, on average, about 20 to 30 uh, receptors. What was pretty interesting is then if you compare uh, that number to the number you get from uh, what's called uh, miniature excitatory postsynaptic current. That means the, the number of receptors that are activated by a single vesicle. Uh, you find, on average, uh, in these cultures uh, for these mini currents, an amplitude of about 20 picoamps. Uh, that corresponds uh, more or less to the same type of, uh, of receptors. So there's a good correlation between the amplitude of the number of receptors activated by a single uh, uh, vesicle released and uh, the number of receptors you could have in each of these uh, single nanoclusters. So that's about the amount of data we have uh, so far on, uh, on the organization of these, uh, of these receptors. And the question we wanted to ask then is, uh, what's, the actual, what's the impact on synaptic function of this organization of the, of the receptors? And so we thought that actually modeling uh, could actually pretty, be pretty informative to try to, to understand what could be the impact of this receptor organization on synaptic transmission. So we actually took a, a model that we, we had developed uh, based on some pub published data, or some published um, models already a while ago, taking a pretty classical uh, kinetic scheme of AMPA receptors. Uh, as you all know, so AMPA receptors are those pretty pretty complex uh, tetrameric structures. Uh, they are activated by the sequential binding of two glutamates that bind here uh, in the ligand binding domain. Uh, what's very important is that they can either open, go to this open state here, uh, or go to a series of desensitized states. And actually, there's a, a very recent paper just ca came out 
a few weeks ago on uh, some new crystal data, uh, which actually can assign uh, the structure of these uh, extracellular domains in the desensitized states to various uh, states, kinetic states here. Basically, what's happening is uh, once glutamate has bound here, there's a big dissociation occurring in the N-terminal domain here that really changes very dramatically the overall organization of the N-terminus and brings it in various desensitized states, some of them being pretty uh, stable, and we'll come back to them. So we use that kinetic model based on the rate constants uh, that had been published in the past, including, uh, including by us, and started to look at uh, the properties of the synaptic current uh, evoked by release of a single uh, release of molecules. We released um, around 3,000 uh, glutamate molecules, and we took a matrix of, re matrix of receptors uh, with a nano cluster here, comprising various numbers of receptors, but most of the time a five by five here, uh, and uh, mimicked uh, recorded a miniature EPSC, adapting the parameters here so that we get a good fit of the, by simulation of the normal uh, excitatory postsynaptic currents. And the first thing we found, uh, which was actually already uh, published by um, Lisman and Rajafari uh, 10 years ago, is that uh, because those receptors have a pretty low affinity for glutamate, which is in the order of uh, several hundreds of uh, micromolar, uh, the overall area over which receptors are activated is actually pretty small. And you see the, the full width half maximum of the Gaussian where receptors are activated is around uh, something like 100 nanometer. And uh, we think that's very important because then it really means that depending on whether you release your glutamate vesicle right on top of a cluster or next to a cluster is going to make a very important difference in the postsynaptic uh, in the postsynaptic response. So we've been exploring that uh, with having some interesting things. Uh, first of all, uh, modifying the where you release the vesicle as compared to the location of the of the nano cluster. Of course, as you move away uh, from the nano cluster, uh, you, you're going to decrease massively the amplitude of the response because the extra cluster density of receptors is much lower. It's not so surprising. Uh, what, what we've been a little surprised by is that actually uh, you see that you can actually do your release uh, up to 50, nearly 100 uh, nanometer away from the cluster uh, before having a very dramatic decrease in the amplitude of your current. So probably, and that's already telling us that there might not be to have to be a perfect match between the site of release and the location of the cluster uh, to get uh, an important uh, response. Uh, then uh, we've also been uh, looking at synapses with, with several clusters and uh, looking at the impact of the intercluster dis uh, distance. And of course, you see that as clusters are more separated, you have less smaller and smaller responses. But probably the most interesting uh, result we got from these simulations is that if we get that, if we take an intercluster difference, which is the average of what we see in spines, which is in the order of uh, 300 nanometer here, uh, and then you release uh, your vesicle, you see that indeed you get a pretty flat response uh, because as you move your release site in between the clusters, as you lose ans uh, the response from one cluster, you start to get response from the other cluster. And so you see a very flat uh, amplitude actually, uh, saying that indeed if you have several clusters in a given PSD, uh, the actual location of the release site might not be uh, so important with respect to the the, to the cluster uh, location. Uh, so that's basically where we are now. We are doing extensive uh, experimental work to try to visualize the site of release with respect to the site of the cluster, uh, but with, uh, so far without success. So only modeling is left to us uh, up to now uh, to, un to understand this, uh, this relation between site of release and, and uh, cluster location. Uh, so let's move on now uh, to the more dynamic aspect of this, uh, this organization of the receptors. And I'm going to start by showing you uh, some of the data we have <coughs> that actually uh, demonstrates that those AMPA receptors are highly mobile. 
And then we'll go on uh, to understand what's the impact of this uh, receptor mobility on uh, fast synaptic transmission. So first of all, these receptors are very mobile. Uh, we found that by a variety of means, starting by uh, tracking receptors by very big latex particles, uh, more than uh, 15 years ago now. Uh, more recently, using either Q dots or I would say more recently using more smaller tags. But this is kind of the hallmark of what actually convinced the community that these receptors are indeed mobile. Uh, tagging those receptors by those small quantum dots, which are a few uh, nanometer uh, organic um, semiconductors, uh, which are extremely photostable. Doing video microscopy, this has been actually uh, very developed now and it's pretty easy to do. Uh, you can see a whole zoology of, uh, of movement of receptors. Uh, some receptors being moving very quickly, some others being stuck in spines, and uh, re some receptors actually exchanging between a synaptic and an extrasynaptic site. And this has been, this type of movies uh, have been very important to actually convince the community, which was initially very resistant, I, I would say, uh, to this idea that receptors are not all stable in synapses, but in fact, most of them are actually pretty mobile. So these type of movies are very amenable to tracking and to, to analysis uh, because of this high accuracy you get from single molecule uh, tracking. And uh, probably the most important finding we made uh, analyzing this type of data uh, is that, uh, so not only extrasynaptic receptors seem to be mobile, as you, as you see on this track of extrasynaptic uh, movements, uh, but actually when we looked at the movement of particles which were colocalized with synaptic stains, we also found a pretty high proportion, about half of the, of the tracks, uh, which displayed pretty strong uh, movements also. And that was very intriguing to, to us. Uh, then uh, by comparing uh, the, what's called the mean square display which is on, on average uh, the surface explored by the receptors, comparing the surface explored by receptors in the extrasynaptic membrane and in the synaptic membrane for these mobile receptors, we found a very big difference. Uh, not so much in the instantaneous movement, which is this uh, diff instantaneous diffusion coefficient, which is not so different as only a factor of three or four here between the, move, the instantaneous speed of movement of those synaptic versus extrasynaptic receptors. Uh, what's very different is the, the curvature of these uh, plots, which indicates to you that those synaptic uh, movements here are extremely confined. So it seemed from this data that uh, synaptic receptors were mobile, uh, but were moving uh, and moving at pretty high rates, but were moving in a confined environment. And actually, uh, we thought, even, even us and more reviewers, uh, that this could be probably an artifact of uh, tracking those receptors with those uh, particles here. Uh, and in fact, as I show you, we are very much convinced now that in fact this is actually true. Uh, so this is the distribution of diffusion coefficients for synaptic receptors. Uh, this is a very systematic, uh, of what, of very representative of what we find. Uh, about half of the receptors here are immobile. You see this is a log scale, very low mobility, virtually immobile receptors. But half of them here are very mobile. And we are going to really focus extensively on these mobile uh, synaptic receptors. Uh, to cut a, a, a long story short, uh, in fact, using small smaller dyes, either palm or single organic dye tracking, we always find the same type of, uh, of distribution, finding half of the receptors being mobile, half of the, of the receptors being immobile. This is some of the data uh, we've been obtaining using palm now, a dynamic palm on live cells, where you can track also the movement of the receptors. You can find the whole uh, diffusion map of the movement of the receptors uh, in these uh, neurites. And if you look at sp on spine heads, uh, where the postsynaptic density is, uh, you see that uh, we find the same results as we had with the Q dots, that the diffusion coefficient in the spine here is slower indeed, but not so much slower, just a factor of three or four uh, slower that, than in, uh, in the extrasynaptic membrane. And then finally, uh, 
by doing uh, time-lapse palm, we could actually combine the, the identification of the localization of the clusters of receptors together with their mobility. And uh, what we found, I think it's... Uh, very, very interesting, is that, not surprisingly, uh, if you look at the clusters of receptors, uh, receptors that are immobile on these clusters, not so surprising, they are, compactly, they are compact and uh, there. But most interesting, uh, in between clusters, receptors are extremely mobile. And uh, if you plot the mean square displacement, uh, if you look at clustered receptors, they are virtually immobile. So that represents about half of the receptors. But the other half that's in between the clusters, they have a mean square displacement that shows that they are extremely uh, mobile, moving nearly uh, freely, although uh, with some more confinement than the extrasynaptic membrane. So altogether, uh, we are pretty convinced now that indeed you should see the PSD as a place where AMPA receptors are either highly clustered, very mobile, or extremely mobile in between the clusters, and we start to have some evidence that they do exchange in between those clusters and outside of the clusters. But I won't show you, uh, show you that today. Uh, and then, uh, in terms of proportions, on average, it's about half of the receptors that are mobile and half of them that are uh, immobile. So, uh, what's the function of this uh, movement of receptors? So, first of all, the global, uh, global function of these movements uh, is something I would say pretty classical, so I'm going to go uh, pretty quickly. It's a classical diffusion trapping uh, model uh, that you, 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 you can compute, uh, whereby receptors are either trapped by uh, postsynaptic molecules or uh, freely moving when they are untrapped. And uh, this type of model actually recapitulates the overall data pretty well. Uh, you can see receptors exchanging between a trapped state and a freely diffusing state. And so using this type of model, we, can, we could actually recapitulate most of the data we, we had. Uh, first of all, looking at the mid-square displacement and the variability, uh, you can uh, get very similar data using this model or classical experiments. Uh, uh, you can model the impact of neural development with the increase in uh, synapse number in the dendritic shaft, uh, mimicking perfectly with this uh, diffusion trapping model uh, the decrease in mobility that you see over time uh, during, the, during development. Uh, you can, of course, adjust the different par parameters by comparing the experiments and the data, finding a K-on and a K-off for this uh, trapping of the, of the receptors. And then uh, something which is probably most, of most interest is that you can recapitulate some of the, uh, the excitatory synaptic current fluctuations uh, due to this mobility, and that's something that's been completely overlooked. Uh, so... As I'm sure some of you know, uh, you have variability in synaptic responses, and this variability uh, depends on the amplitude of the response, getting more variability on smaller responses than larger uh, responses. And you can actually find the same thing uh, looking at the mobility of receptors. And so we think that actually mobility of receptors in and out uh, synapses actually has a strong impact on this variability, which was initially only uh, attributed to variability in transmitter release. So we think that actually variability in receptor numbers, fast variability in receptor numbers due to fast diffusion actually has an impact on um, on the coefficient of variation of synaptic responses. And that's, uh, I would say, uh, an experiment I like, a theoretical experiment I like. So looking at the variability on the number of receptors by simulation on these uh, postsynaptic areas, and then mimicking an experiment, we're going to go in detail right after, by immobilizing receptors, by cross-linking them with uh, antibodies. You see, you suppress the variability in the number of receptors, hence in the, in the amplitude of the postsynaptic response. And that's also something we had found experimentally uh, a while ago, uh, looking at the variability of excitatory postsynaptic currents. When you immobilize receptors, you get less variability. So that was telling us, and uh, this is confirmed by those simulation experiments, that actually receptor mobility is fast enough to actually impact 
fast synaptic transmission. And that's something that, was, that came as a complete surprise uh, to us and also to the community, and I would say that's not completely accepted yet. And so I would like to really develop a little more on, onto that in the next uh, few minutes uh, to see how could actually uh, fast receptor diffusion impact uh, fast synaptic transmission. Uh, Coming then to this last part, what's the, the actual function of fast amperoreceptor movement in fast synaptic transmission? And probably uh, the, the most interesting finding we had uh, on that aspect came uh, in that paper we, pu we published now uh, six years ago, where uh, by immobilizing amperoreceptors, by cross-linking them with uh, antibodies, we found a very strong impact on short-term plasticity. Basically, short-term plasticity is this process whereby when you do a sequential uh, high-frequency stimulation of the cell, uh, you see changes in the amplitude of the response. Here in, those, in that cell, uh, the, the amplitude was uh, similar in between the two pearls. And after cross-linking, uh, you see a big depression of the second pulse. And basically, the first pulse is not affected, you only affect the second pulse. Uh, and you can recapitulate that by uh, iontophoretic application of glutamate. And so the question was really how could uh, receptor mobility impact uh, this short-term plasticity? And so to understand that, we have to go back a little to the, the scheme of amperoreceptor receptor activation that I've kind of uh, showed you in a more complex way just before. So as you remember, receptors are initially in an inactive state, binding of glutamate, they get opened in a few milliseconds, and then uh, they get desensitized, and that desensitized state is relatively stable. And it takes tens to hundreds of milliseconds, depending on the receptor composition, uh, for receptors to recover from uh, this desensitized state. And this uh, desensitization actually contributes to what's called paired pulse depression, short synaptic depression. And uh, so the idea is that when you do this high frequency stimulation, you see a depression of the postsynaptic response, and that depression is due uh, to the fact that. Uh, Either you lose a uh, transmitter or you desensitize the, the receptor. And in fact, in most cases, in most synapses, uh, synaptic depression has been attributed to uh, loss of uh, presynaptic transmitter. And the, the role of postsynaptic uh, desensitization has been uh, a bit probably underlooked uh, for, for a reason I'm going to tell you in a second. <coughs> So this postsynaptic depression, as you've understood, I'm sure, is the idea that uh, when you release transmitter, receptors get desensitized very quickly, and because it takes them a while to recover from desensitization, if you have glutamate release on the same location, uh, only a few tens of milliseconds after, uh, receptors are still desensitized, so you get a smaller response. And as I said, uh, this implication of receptor desensitization in Pearl's depression is, is a bit controversial, and uh, we think one of the reasons for that is that uh, what has not been taken into account in this type of rezoning is actually uh, receptor um, uh, movements. Uh, so the idea we have uh, is that indeed in this recovery from paired pulse depression, uh, you have not only recovery from desensitization, but you also have recovery by exchange of receptors. And uh, the idea is that when you release glutamate, you activate receptors, they get desensitized, but then those desensitized receptors can actually exchange by diffusion and be exchanged by uh, exchange for by naive receptors uh, so that uh, you get a faster recovery if receptors are mobile than uh, if receptors are not mobile. And I must say, when we initially uh, submitted this, uh, this data, there was a very strong reaction against it, saying basically that it's absolutely impossible uh, that receptors move fast enough to exchange uh, in, in, inside the PSD. And modeling was really very helpful at that time to actually show that, it's, uh, in fact, it is possible. Uh, you can have fast enough exchange of receptors uh, to explain this type of recovery. And the basic reason for that are, is dual. First of all, receptors move much faster than when we thought. And second, the area over which receptors are activated is pretty small. Uh, so I guess uh, what we really need to understand, and that's where modeling is going to be very helpful, is what's the impact between receptor organization and fast synaptic transmission and rates of exchange. 
trying to understand uh, what's the role of the area over which receptors are activated, how, how they exchange, how, uh, how this is related to their uh, kinetic states. So just to show you a few of our attempts uh, to go into that to finish this, uh, this talk, uh, comparing the organization of receptors uh, and their impact on this short-term plasticity. So back to the scheme, uh, doing now sequential uh, glutamate release at various interstimulus intervals, looking at the recovery. Uh, from synaptic depression, either when receptors are immobile or when receptors are mobile. Uh, first of all, uh, computing the, the fraction of exchange receptors, depending on the zone over which receptors are activated, there is a very strong impact, of course. Uh, if you assume that receptors are activated over the whole PSD, uh, like over 400, 500 nanometer, you, you don't have exchange because diffusion, although it's fast, is still a bit, it's not that fast. And so you, you really have a cutoff around 100 nanometer uh, if you want to have a sizable uh, exchange of receptors. And so that's where actually the affinity of AMPA receptors is going to be very important because depending on their affinity, the area over which they're going to be activated is going to be very different. And then, of course, over time, uh, this depends. The rate of exchange, the fraction of exchange receptors depends over time. Uh, of course, if you have a very big, big area of activation of receptors, uh, it takes forever before receptors are activated. But you see, if you have a 100 nanometer area of activated receptors, you see that uh, within 10 milliseconds, you have uh, nearly half of the receptors have had time to exchange between uh, one state and the other. Uh, then, uh, looking at the impact of this diffusion on the recovery from paired pulse depression, uh, this is the model, this is the actual experiments. Uh, you see they are kind of similar, although not perfectly uh, parallel yet. Uh, you see when you cross-link receptors or on when, when you model a diffusion of, uh, of zero, uh, you have a slower recovery from depression. Uh, one difference between the, the model and the, and the data you see is that in the experiments, uh, they do depress uh, a little more, but that actually it's just a matter of adjusting the, the parameters of the, of the kinetic model of the receptors. Uh, so I would say to, to finish, uh, we really think now that uh, this exchange of receptors between the site of release and the, and the rest of the PSD or the extrasynaptic membrane is going to be having a very strong impact on this uh, recovery. Uh, and we think that's uh, very important for a number of physiological uh, processes. Uh, I'm not showing you at that at all because my time is over. Uh, but basically, we've been able to make a, a variety of different experiments uh, that show that by regulating the mobility of the receptors, you can switch from one state to the other. For example, uh, CAM kinase activation, uh, regulation of uh, AMPA receptor binding to PSD95 uh, really immobilize receptors and induce uh, strong paired pulse depression. Uh, reciprocally, if you remove the extracellular matrix, you can actually re accelerate receptor movement and get a faster um, recovery. So uh, altogether, I think we should really change a little our view of the, the organization of the receptors and the impact of this uh, mobility on, on their function. Uh, we think that the location of uh, these AMPA receptor clusters with respect to the release site is an important thing to understand. Uh, we have no clue now whether actually uh, receptor release occurs on the clusters or randomly anywhere. Uh, what we do know is that receptors are very mobile in between those clusters, and this mobility has a strong impact uh, on this uh, recovery from short-term depression. Uh, and uh, I think that's going to be a pretty important venue to, to explore in the future. And I'm really convinced that modeling this whole, asp this whole aspect of synapse function is interesting. Uh, just to, to finish, I should really mention two very important people here for what I've told you about today. Uh, Martin Heine, which is now a group leader in Magdeburg, has really been uh, the discoverer of the impact of receptor mobility on short-term synaptic plasticity when he won a, a postdoc in my group. And a lot of the modeling I've been showing you is done in collaboration with Olivier Tumin, which is in the Institute. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
elements also part of the model of the model of the miniature EPSC sizes, or, or you're actually trying to match it strictly to the distribution of of, nano, of the domain sizes? Yeah, in that in that work, it's strictly matched to the variance of the receptor size, actually. This modeling, it's strictly, strictly uh, looking at the, the variance in the receptor. So the distance from Toma is not taken into account at all. This is very crude and of what's going on in the uh, AMPA receptors. Uh, is there anything like this uh, been done for the NMDA receptors? And if so, how do you see the relationship? So that, that's, 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 of course, a very important question because NMDA receptors are extremely important for uh, synaptic plasticity. Uh, the problem is NMDA receptors are much more difficult to work with. And that's, although we are desperately trying to do that, we are much less advanced uh, into that. Uh, what I can tell you is, I mean, the, the preliminary data we have now uh, is, well, first of all, there are much less NMDA receptors than AMPA receptors, nearly 10 times less. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, so there's nearly 10 times less receptors, and we don't find them uh, organized in clusters. So, so far, the data we have actually show NMDA receptors to be rather randomly distributed over the, the whole uh, PSD. Uh, and it kind of makes sense because NMDA receptors have a much higher affinity for glutamate than, uh, than AMPA receptors. So probably their, their, local, their location is a bit less uh, important with, with that respect. In terms of, the, of their dynamics, uh, NMDA receptors are very interesting in the sense that they display a very broad uh, dynamics depending on their composition. So what we do know, and that's actually published, is that NR2A receptors uh, are extremely mobile. They are very, very stuck to the, to the PSD. They, they barely move. NR2B containing receptors are highly mobile. Not quite as mobile as AMPA receptors, but they, they do still exchange a lot. And in fact, there, there is a paper published by my uh, colleague, uh, Grok, uh, just recently in EMBO, uh, just a few weeks or months ago, uh, showing that uh, actually <clears throat> changing the mobility of these NR2B containing receptors has a very strong impact on the LTP induction uh, because, of, because of modifying that. So, so there are things to be done there. sorry, the interplay between the number of vesicles being released and the mobility and number of the receptors, because it's really the sum of those two that should, or the sum, the interaction of those two that should give you the dynamics and the plasticity. And it would be interesting to know how that I mean, I'm, I know I'm asking a lot. Yeah, no, no, no. Especially experimental. I fully agree. Uh, in fact, I fully agree. I think that's one of the biggest points that we have not addressed uh, yet. Uh, in fact, in this model and in, in the actual, to understand those data that uh, mobility has an impact on short-term plasticity, one of the biggest challenge is the, the frequency at which you you have uh, simultaneous, you have re not se you have sequential release on the same uh, synapse. Uh, so we we are starting to put that into the into the game, uh, but what really we what we really want to have is actual experimental data to look at uh, single release sites. Uh, and that, that's actually pretty difficult, and I'm open to any, any suggestion for that. Because really, I mean, the idea, there's a fierce battle in the field. And, and I was uh, just a couple of weeks ago at another meeting where you have completely opposite views from different people. Some of them saying that, you know, you cannot have more than one hertz release at a given release site. Some other people saying that well, you can have up to 100 hertz release at a given release site. And that, that's going to make a very big difference in the, the actual data. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm not sure the paper is out, but Martin Heiner has actually a, a paper 
in press uh, uh, about that. Uh, comparing interneurons and uh, so shaft synapses, I would say, and the spine synapses, which is also a thing. And so in it's, it's slightly disappointing in the sense that we thought there would be a very big difference. Uh, there is a difference. So in fact, the receptor exchange seems to be a bit faster in the, in the interneurons, but it's not as big as we thought initially. And I, my view now is that it can be nearly completely explained by, by the shape. Of the of, of the by the spine shape, which which does induce some confinement uh, with respect to the shaft synapses. Yeah, that's actually a, a big big part of my group is actually working on that. Uh, so we do know a lot of the molecules which are involved in stabilizing the receptors, PSD95, auxiliary subunits, and all that. What we don't know, and it's actually coming a bit as a surprise, uh, we don't know what's holding the receptors together in these nanoclusters. Uh, we thought it would be very easy. I mean, we thought it would be TARPs and PSD95, and it's, it doesn't seem so easy. Uh, so, so I. I, in fact, I don't know. One idea I have is that there, there might be some uh, lateral interactions uh, in between the, the end terminus of the, of the receptors that may help because those ampere receptors are really a tower. I mean, they are very different from the, the image we had of them uh, uh, some years ago before the crystal structure. They are really a big tower. And so if you, in those clusters, they are very compactly, they are very packed. And so certainly uh, interaction in their end terminus domain could play a role in that. The one thing we are very surprised that by is is the, the, the extreme homogeneity of the size of the clusters. You know, they are, they are much more homogeneous than what theory could... Uh, would. If you just model a, di a diffusion trapping um, organization, you would have a much, high, much broader variability in the size of the clusters. So there has to be some type of additional interaction that holds them together. And we, we haven't found the, the, the mechanism yet. <laughs> 